Amen. And tonight as I preach, I would like to preach on this subject. Which malefactor are you? Which malefactor are you? Amen. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15 reads like this. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the presence that we have so sweetly already felt in this place. And Lord, I pray for the anointing of the Holy Ghost to fall upon my heart and my mind as I would speak and preach your word. I pray, Lord, that each and every heart and each and every mind, each and every ear in this place would be open to receive from you tonight the word, O oh God, which they need to hear and that we need to hear. I pray for the anointing of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Acts chapter 26 and verse 28 says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Almost. You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Some of the saddest words ever written in the scriptures are these. You almost persuaded me to become a Christian. The world had been given the op the word, excuse me, had been given. The opportunity was there. And understanding was with Agrippa. He had the opportunity he had the understanding, and it, the, uh, that understanding was with him, but there was no acceptance. You see, as you look at this, you realize how sad these words were. John Greenleaf Whittier once said, For all sad words of tongue and pen, the saddest are these. It might have been. And where I can agree with Mr. Whittier, when one looks back on their life, I believe that what Agrippa was saying was even sadder than even and even worse. And what he was describing concerned more than ideas and actions of one's choices. These are concerns uh, of and, and choices of this present life. It dealt with his eternity. You see, when we go through our lives, we need to understand that the life choices that we make here and now while on this earth matter for eternity. We don't have the option of just playing games with God. And, and sadly, that is exactly what many people do. And I pray this evening that none of you here are playing with your eternity. I pray to God that nobody here is choosing to just show up and go through the rituals. Some may not even be going through the rituals. Some may be coming. I remember at a time in my life when I would come to church. Back then it wasn't Wednesday night, it was Thursday night. I'd come to church on Thursday night, it was prayer and then Bible study. And then on Sunday morning, and Sunday night, and then again on Tuesday night, we had youth. And I remember coming to each service. And I remember taking and praying and, and getting my right, heart right with God. But then the next day, I was going back out and living the exact same way I'd been the night before when I went into church. And if that happened with me, I can only venture to say it's probably happening with some of you. You see, the devil knows how to play games with us. I remember many a night when I would go home and I would lay on my bed at the end of a day and I would lay there and I would toss 
and I would turn. And I would just, my mind was troubled because I knew good and well what I had done that day and the way I'd acted and the way I'd spoken and the things that I had looked at and partook of were not pleasing in the eyes of God. You know, I guess I had this warped thinking that you know, because during the day when I was up and about and doing all these things, I didn't have any problem with God. Because I wasn't thinking about God. I guess I was thinking about the scripture, he's going to come as a thief in the night. So therefore, he's not going to come in the daytime. Well, the problem with that is, if it's nighttime here, it's daytime somewhere else. So if it's nighttime there, that means it's daytime here, which tells me he can come at any time. You know, we can convince ourselves of just about anything. We can justify just about anything. We can get ourselves thinking that I'm okay as long as it's light out. But it's when the lights go down and the night goes comes up and, and the sun goes down, then i got to start to worry about it. You see... What we read here, he was describe, what he was describing concerned more than ideas and actions of one's choices concerning this present life. It dealt with Agrippa's eternity. The Bible is replete with examples of people coming to Jesus and accepting him. As we read through the scripture, we read about a woman at the well. This woman at the well, she would have been one that, you know, uh, a Jew wouldn't have anything to do with. But we read in John chapter 4 and verse 26 where Jesus actually spoke to her and he said, I who speak to you am he. And then we go on and jump down to verse 28 through 30 and the woman then left her water pot went her way into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I had ever done. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Jumping down to verses 39 through 42, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many were there, and many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. You see, when we get the revelation, when it becomes a part of us, when Christ begins to speak into our lives, we need to become witnesses. And as the woman at the well, this Samaritan woman, who really shouldn't have been speaking to Jesus, or should I say during that time, Jesus shouldn't have been speaking to her. When he spoke into her life, it made an impact in her life and caused her to see the sin of her life and be, be needing in, the, in her needing of him. And so when that happened, what ends up happening? She goes in and she begins to talk to those that she knows and those she begins to share and she begins to tell others, you need to come. We as a church need to be inviting people into the house of God. If we don't believe that there's enough people here, whose fault is that? Is that Pastor Barnett's? No. That's ours. Because we ought to be reaching out to our fellow co-workers, our neighbors, those that are around about us, those that we bump into every day. You know, it's, it's amazing. Um, the last two days, Yesterday morning, um, I'd rather my wife tell this story, but she's not here, so I'm going to tell it on her. I'm going to, I'm going to testify for my wife. Yesterday morning, she was on her way here to the church to pray. 
And as she was coming to church, she got looking out over Lake Michigan and saw this beautiful, beautiful sunrise. And so she decided, you know what? I got to stop and take a picture. I just, you know, if you know my wife, you know she loves the water. She loves the beauty that God has given us. You know, I call Lake Michigan Cindy's Ocean or Ocean Cindy because, you know, she she just doesn't believe it's a lake. But beside that, she just loves the water. So on her way here, she pulled off, started following the roads until I, I don't even know where she ended up. Somewhere between Racine and here, though, she found an area to pull up to and get out of the car and start taking some pictures. Lo and behold, there's another woman already there. And she gets, a, as she sees Cindy, and she, Cindy's got her tablet, and she's taking pictures, she gets out and she says, isn't this beautiful? I come here every morning just to take pictures and to see how beautiful this is. Now, if you know my wife, you don't speak to her like that very long, and she's witnessing to you. That is just my wife. I used to tease her. She had a bathroom ministry. She would go into the bathroom and come out having witnessed to somebody in the bathroom. But she began to speak with this woman, and the next thing we know, this woman is asking Cindy questions. And when Cindy begins to talk, the, the 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 issue of being filled with the Holy Ghost comes up or the Holy Spirit. And this woman says, you mean talking in tongues? And Cindy said, yes. And and, and she shared where the church was and, and and she she wanted to get, you know, the woman's number and everything else, but they didn't have a pen, you know, all, all kinds of things. But the woman says, I'll be here again tomorrow. Come back here tomorrow. And so Cindy is looking for the opportunity to share with this woman about the Holy Ghost, baptism in Jesus' name, and just living an overcoming life. That was yesterday, this morning. She's on her way to come here again to pray. She's getting in the car, getting going out to the car to get in the car, and along comes a man walking his dog in front of the house. A simple good morning turns in to a time of witnessing and sharing God with this person that's just walking his dog. You see, no matter who we come across, no matter how busy our day, when we come into the life of somebody else, it is not by accident. God has set that. He has predestined that. He has set that up so that you can be in that person's life to be able to share the love of Christ with them. We read in the book of Luke chapter 8, verses 43 through 48, about a woman that had an issue of blood. And beginning in verse 43, now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians, and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his, Jesus' garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Somebody touched me. For I perceived power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how, and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. You see, these accepted Christ as soon as they were in contact with him. We can read, read about Jesus' calling of Simon Peter, of Andrew, of James and John in Matthew chapter 4, 
verses 18 through 22. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And look at verse 20. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. In the boat was Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. In verse 22, again, and in a month, in a year, in ten years, they decided to follow him. No. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. You see, not only is, it, is the Bible full of stories and situations and, and things about people that actually rejected Jesus, it is also filled with people that have chosen to follow him. We also read where there were those who rejected Jesus. Matthew 26, verses 63 through 65. But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. You see, there are people even today that believe that anything to do with Christ is blasphemy. They believe that they can follow any road they want, and they believe that all roads lead to heaven. They believe that no matter what they want to believe, they can believe that that speaker over there in the corner is God. And as long as they believe it hard enough, and they believe it truly enough, and really worship it, and really set it up in their minds and their hearts as being God, God's going to accept them because they were true and they were honest in their belief. But you see, that's not the way it is. You see, there is a, 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 a need in our lives to follow after the one true God. In his defense of the deity of Christ in the book Mirror Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote these words. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. We, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman who's, or something worse. He can shut, you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Lewis bases his reasoning on the profession uh, that Jesus made as to his own identity. Since he claimed to be the Messiah and identified himself as one with the Father, there can be no middle ground in assessing his identity. Either he was who he claimed to be, or he was not. If he was not, only two options are available. He was mistaken, or he was intentionally deceptive. We accept his testimony and declare that Jesus Christ to be both Lord and God. And with all that being said, I'd like to introduce you 
to two men. They are in the same encounter, at the same time, in the same circumstances, but have totally different responses. In Luke chapter 23, verses 32 and 33, we read, there were also two others, criminals, led, by him, with, him, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to that place called Calvary, there they crucified him, the criminals, on one on the right hand and the other on the left. Jumping down to verse 39, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The King James Version, when it speaks of these men, calls them malefactors. Thus, the title of this message. Which malefactor are you? The New King James Version calls them criminals. Both had committed crimes. Both had been sentenced to death. And both, at one point, reviled Jesus. Mark chapter 15, in the end of verse 32, says... Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. The NIV version says that they heaped insults on him. The New Living Translation says that they ridiculed him. The New American Standard Version says they, insult, they were insulting him. The American Standard Version says they reproached him. And the Bible in basic English says that they said evil things against him. In short, they weren't speaking too nicely about Jesus to begin with. But one of those men began to understand, as we just read it here this evening in Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 42, we re have read that one began to change. One is still blaspheming Jesus, but the other begins to examine his life, begins to change his attitude. And church, we, and I would hope, daily examine our lives. The other, uh, one compares his life to Jesus, and he realizes that Jesus is not deserving of death. As he begins to look at Jesus... There is something about Jesus Christ that goes forth from him. That even the sinner hanging on the cross beside him realizes that there is something different about this man. He realizes that Jesus is truly the Christ. And he asks Jesus to remember him. And he gets a whole lot more and he gets paradise in the end. But my question for you tonight is, when you walk into a place, when you call somebody on the phone, when you meet somebody face to face, whether it's for the hundredth time or the first time, do they see something different in your life? We need to live our lives in such a way as Jesus lived that we put forth the love of Christ into others' lives. You see, a lot of times we think that the only time we need to be Christian is when we show up to church on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Oh, by the way, uh, tomorrow morning, ladies' prayer. Amen? 10 o'clock. Tomorrow night, corporate prayer. Amen? 7 o'clock. And then Saturday night at 7 is men's meeting. I'm just throwing this out. Men, we want to all be here. 
So if you can be here, come. We're going to have a time of fellowship and the word. And uh, if, are you flashing fingers at me? Six o'clock? Is that what you're saying? What is that the time you want it to be? Oh, at six o'clock Saturday night. I think I may have said seven in the text, but it's six o'clock uh, Saturday night. And men come in fellowship, and then Sunday morning again at, at 9.30 is prayer, 10 o'clock is morning service. Amen. Sunday school, 11 o'clock morning service. But anyhow, getting back to the message, that was just free. That one was a commercial break. Amen. It seems like no matter what you get into, you get commercial breaks now, so I figured I'd throw one in. Amen. But we as Christians ought to live our lives in such a way that people notice something different about you. They ought to notice something different about the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you act, the things that you do, the places that you go. You know, when, trust me, if, if you are around people enough, hello, what's going on? Hello? If you are around people enough, maybe the battery's going to Brother, oh, there we go. If people are around you enough, they ought to see something different in your life. They ought to realize that there's something different in your life. There was a time in my life not too long ago, thank the Lord it's in my past, that I was going through a big struggle. I was going through a very difficult point in my life. And it was to the point where I, I am a very private person. So if I'm having an issue at home, I hope you don't know about it. Not because I'm trying to hide it from you, but because I don't think it concerns you. If I have an issue with Billy, I'm not going to go around to all of you and let you know I'm having an issue with Billy. Well, it just so happened one day while I was working with the guy I worked with six days a week, very closely with, something slipped in, in my conversation. And I just happened to say something that it wasn't bad, it wasn't off color, it was, but it, it let him see into my personal life, in my home life. And of course, him being who he was and the fact that we were, you know, he was young enough to be my son, but the fact that we worked together, all he did, Leo, is he started asking a lot of questions. And so, of course, I eventually broke, and I just explained to him what was going on in my life. And he said, when did this happen? He said, I, I, I didn't know anything about it. Did this just happen yesterday? I'm like, no, I've been going through it for about a year and a half now. And he's like, what? You see, all I wanted him to see was the love of Christ. All I wanted him to feel was the love of Christ. Albeit, when he heard what was going on, that only solidified, I think is the word I want, my walk with God, because he said, how can you live that? If, if, if I was going through what you're going through, everybody would know about it. I would be doing this, this, and this, you know, and he's, he's just tearing up and, you know, but we need to live our lives in such a way that God is the first thing that people see. You know, people that are close to us, they're going to see when we're going through struggles. They're going to see when we are going through hard times. They're going to realize that we're in troubles. But you know what they begin to watch then? How is he going to go through it? How is he going to act now? I've seen him be all, or her, be all mighty Christian when things are going good. But now that things are going bad, is their speech going to change? 
Are their actions going to change? Are the things, the places they go and the people they see and the way they talk, is it all going to change? Or are they going to stay this solid, rock-solid Christian? You see, we are like one of these two criminals. We deserve the death penalty and the death sentence for our sins. There's not a one of us here that have been able to avoid all of that in and of ourselves. We can go either way. We can blaspheme God and go our own way and turn our back on Him and continue on the path that we're on. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means you. That means me, that means all of us. Because Reggie, all means all, and that's all all means. That means every one of us have sinned, and we have fallen short of the glory of God. But you see, the beauty is, is that Jesus Christ has given us that opportunity to change all of that by trusting in him. We can see ourselves for who we really are and turn our lives completely and totally over to Him. We can do that. We can repent, do an about face. I, I love the example, and, I, and you've heard me use it before, but there may be some here tonight. I see one or two that may not have heard it, so for their benefit, I'm going to say it. Repentance is not just getting on your knees and saying, God, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. And then getting up and going on with our way. You see, repentance is doing an about face. So, if I am going towards sin and I'm living in sin and everything in my life concerns the sin and my desire is for the sin and I repent, not only do I say, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me, but I do an about face and I turn around. In Europe, I've been told in, in England, in, in the United States, if you're in the army, they say about face and they turn around and start going the other way. But I've been told that in England, in Europe, it's not about face, it's repent, which means turn around and go the other way. And that's what we need to do. We can be baptized in the name of Jesus just as we baptized Lynn Sunday morning in that beautiful name of Jesus, washing the sins away and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, the gift of the Holy Spirit into our life. And let me tell you something. That will begin to change your life. In fact, it not only will begin to change, it ought to change your life immediately. Maybe you are finding yourself tonight having grown cold in your walk with God. You know, I, I, I hate to say this, but there are people that are going to go to hell from a church pew. They're going to go to hell. The rapture takes place, or they go out and fall over of a heart attack or die some way or whatever. I don't care if you have been going to church for my dad, 82 years. I don't care how long you've been going to church. If you have not applied that into your life and all you're doing is showing up, you don't get brownie points with Jesus. You don't get He's, he's not up there tallying every time you come to church. He's not tallying every time you give a penny in the offering. Or a dollar. Or a five dollar bill. He's not tallying up every time you support the youth group. You know, and get something in return. I, I think I shared this. We had in, in Ohio, the church I was in in Ohio, we had a a, a 
huge rummage sale every every other year. In fact, they just did it this year. I saw them advertising for it. It's huge. It's like 50 family, you know, rummage sale. And they start in like January, getting everything, the donations cleaned up. They make sure everything's spick and span, you know, and you walk in and it is set up like a store. So they have the men's department, the ladies department, the clothing department, the glasswares, and, and you know, all these kind of, all different areas. And I remember this one year, I was collecting money. They would come out, and as they'd come out, they'd go by this table. And this particular year, we had it at a house. Uh, the pastor was selling his home and had moved out of this huge Victorian home, house that they had. And so we set it up there. So it looked like a, you know, it was advertised as a rummage sale. People thought it was a rummage sale. But when the woman, uh, one of these women came out, she's like, where do you get 50 families to be able to get all this stuff together? And so I was saying, well, it's actually a church rummage sale. So the proceeds are going to the church, you know, to help with expenses and, and missionaries and, and things of that nature. And literally, she was buying an item that was under $5. I, I want to say it was like $1.50. It wasn't much. But as she paid for it, and as I'm giving her her change back, she goes, oh, that's so wonderful. Now I have something more for God to reward me for. Really. You just got something in exchange for your dollar fifty. Hey, you didn't even just donate a dollar fifty. You bought something. The church is the ones that are saying, okay, the proceeds for this is going for missions. Not you. But you're thinking that that's going to add another jewel in your crown. And so, though, me being who I am, I asked her where she went to church. Oh, I don't go to church anywhere. But I keep track of all the things that I give to the church. I'm so glad you explained to me that this was a church function. Can you imagine thinking that one day you're going to be able to stand before God and say, God, here's my list. These are all the times that I was good. These are all the times that I gave money to a church. I went and played bingo every Tuesday night and gave this much money to the church. I went to these suppers and these dinners and I supported these walkathons and this, that, and the other. But Jesus is going to say, but did you do what I told you to do in the Word? Well, no, God, I didn't because I, I didn't really think I needed to do that. But I got this list. Church, we need to understand that we must have a relationship with God. Maybe your relationship with God is not where it once was. You find yourself following after the things of the world more than after the things of God. Your prayer life is not what it should be, possibly even non-existent. You don't even pray anymore. Possibly you no longer hunger for his word. You're no longer fasting. You're no longer witnessing about the things of God. But tonight, the choice is yours to make a difference. How are you going to respond? Will you despise Jesus and reproach him? Or will you make things right with him and seek his forgiveness and draw closer to him? hungering and thirsting after righteousness. I don't care where we are in our work, walk with God. I truly believe that every single one of us can and should get closer to God. I don't care if before service we met here at 6.30 and we prayed from 6.30 to 6.50, 6.55 prior to church. I don't care if you were here and you were praying in that time 
you are speaking in tongues and loving on God, I believe you can now get closer to him even than yet. There is something about seeking after God. There is something about desiring more of God. My heart's desire is, God, I want more of you. It's so easy. It is so easy, young men, to get so wrapped up in this world. You know, Isaiah, you, you just started another job. And, and all of a sudden, you start making a paycheck. And this isn't just Isaiah, this is any young person. You start working and you start making a little bit of money. And now this money isn't money I have to go to dad and say, Dad, I want to buy this. And, yeah, son, if you go clean your room or if you go wash my car or whatever, you know, I'll give you a few bucks. This money is yours. And it starts to feel good. Because at your age, you don't have bills to pay yet. And you have this money and but then they all of a sudden come up to you and they ask you, hey, you want to work Sunday? It's time and a half. I was making eight bucks an hour. Sunday I can make 12. Oh, yeah. But yet, Sunday's my day of rest. Sunday's my day in which I'm supposed to be in church. And I know and I understand, trust me, I worked a job where they forced us to work seven days a week. And, but I'm going to say this, I was still in church every opportunity I had. I actually shifted shifts so that I could be in church. But you see, it's easy for us to start looking at the things of this world. And this isn't only for the young people. This is for us as adults. We allow our level of living to outgrow our level of giving. Because all of a sudden, now I've got more toys that i got to pay for and i got to maintain. And so I can't give as much unto God. Church, we need to understand that our walk with God is dictated by us. I, if, if it was up to me, every one of you would be so on fire for God, you'd be pumped 24-7. You'd be walking, talking, witnesses. You know, you'd just be everybody you meet. Hey, if I told you about Jesus, if I told you, know, that, if, if I had control of that for you, that's what I'd control. That's the way I'd say it. You see, I, I, I can't make you do that. The only person I can make do that is standing before you tonight looking at you. You have to make that decision for yourself. Let's all stand. I didn't send Sister Kettleton a song to play, so if she's got something she can play, have at it. But I want to say this. These altars are open. You know where you stand in your walk with God. And I don't want us thinking that, well, this is Wednesday night, so Wednesday night we don't really have to come pray. I want us to start looking at every service as an opportunity to get closer to God. Desiring more of God. And my desire, oh God, is I want more of you. I don't want to push you off. I don't want to ridicule you. I don't, I don't want to, you know, when I'm, when I'm with my Christian buddies, I don't want to praise and worship you. But when I'm with my worldly buddies, I don't want to act like I don't know you. God, let my life be one that worships and praises you continually. Amen? Amen. These altars are open. Come, let us pray.